And welcome back. The gruesome struggle of racial equality and justice has plagued communities of color for many generations. In the 1960s, national attention was focused on extreme racial discrimination in the South, as well as the challenges being faced by many, including housing discrimination, educational dis uh, discrimination, educational opportunities, and also the limited employment opportunities for African Americans. For seven months in the 1960s, there were hundreds of black and white volunteers who actually traveled on Southern bus and train stations in an attempt to compel the federal government to enforce a U.S. Supreme Court ruling declaring discrimination in interstate public transportation illegal. Our next guest was one of 15 original Freedom Riders in Mississippi determined to expose Southern resistance to a 1960 Supreme Court ruling, which desegregated facilities in bus and train stations. They were aiming to also transform our society into one of equality and justice. It's my pleasure, it's my privilege, it's my honor to introduce one of the original Freedom Riders here to share his point of view, none other than Reverend Leroy Glenwright. And Reverend Glenwright, thank you so much for being with us here on the Social Justice Forum. Which I'm glad to be of service. I want to take the time for you, for many people who may not know, um, you were one of those original Freedom Riders. You rode with uh, former Congressman John Lewis and also uh, C.T. Vivian, who was also a friend of yours. Uh, from your perspective, first of all, just your thoughts on the passing of John Lewis and C.T. Vivian, and both of their passings happened within 24 hours. And first of all, our condolences to you, too. Yes, it's, uh, it was quite shocking. You know, I received an email from one of my friends in, uh, from Fifth, where we went to school, uh, from California, informing me like 11.30 p.m. that John Lewis had passed. And I had previously uh, learned that CT had also uh, passed early in the day. It was quite a shock. But I thank you for the condolences. Uh, it's, uh, it was just amazing to to hear that news uh, at, 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 at twice in one day. A lot of people don't know it, but John Lewis was also an ordained uh, Baptist minister, a graduate of uh, American Baptist Theological Seminary in Nashville, Tennessee. And upon graduation from there, he matriculated at this university where I was a student. And uh, I, let, let it be known that uh, he he was the uh, uh, picked up the uh, freedom ride uh, in in Washington D.C. after they was stopped uh, in 1947. Then he picked it up in uh, 1961 uh, with uh, uh, James Peck. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but James Peck was one of the original uh, Freedom Riders in what was called the Journey of Reconciliation in 1947. And it continued on up until uh, 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 Washington, D.C. They, they were testing to see if, if the Supreme Court's ruling was being implemented. And when they got to Washington, uh, then they halted it because they were uh, legal. Arrested, so then they decided that they were going to do it again in 1961, and that's where John Lewis was the one person from the Nashville movement who was uh, on, on the journey from Washington down. I think they got as far as Anderson, Alabama, where, where the, the bus was burned and I don't know, on Mother's Day in 1961. And Dr. Wright, I want you to take a moment with me and walk through it. We have uh, some very powerful pictures. And one of those pictures here is, I believe you are actually being arraigned with John Lewis. Tell us about what was happening then. Uh, we, w we went before the judge. Uh, we were charged with uh, blocking the facts. But the, uh, the judge ruled that the uh, law had been repealed and thrown out. And so he dismissed the charges. And so we were let go on that. I'm not guilty. Being arrested for civil disobedience, being arrested uh, multiple times. Talk to us about that feeling of being arrested because 
uh, nowadays it's almost like being arrested for civil disobedience is almost like a cool thing. But back then, you were really putting your life on the line. Uh, I, I got hit in the head, and I, my left eye hit, and I still have problems with my left eye with about the knee to the top because we were standing in front of the movie theater, and this police officer hit me in the hit his head, my, my eye right here. They took me to the emergency room and caused quite a stir, but thank God I, I would survive that. Uh, but th there were other people who were beaten. I had incidents where we had sit-ins at the, I don't know if you know, the White Castle restaurant. Are you, are you familiar with that? Absolutely. Uh, we, were, we were doing a sit-in there, and they told us we can't come in, and I had my hand, my elbows on the, on the counter, and the waitress took some hot, scalding hot water and poured it on, 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 on the counter and burned my elbows you know, during that time. There were different incidents like that, but basically uh, I, I, I escaped any real danger. I, and I missed out on the Anderson thing because that, that was the trip that John Lewis was going down down south and then he stopped there and they had said that they were going to stop the freedom riders after that but then the Nashville SNCC decided that we would continue it all so we sent representatives down to Birmingham drove them down there and Bull Connor I don't know if you're familiar with him but Bull Connor was the police chief and mayor or whatever at the time he was he uh he uh put them in the car, drove them back to the Tennessee st state line and told them to don't come back. But nonetheless, we were hard-headed. We went back, we sent another car back and he went from, from Birmingham. Well, some people got beat up in, uh, in, in, in Birmingham on another bus. There were two buses, Greyhound and Trailway. That then the new group that drove down there, they got on the bus and they had an escort. I guess it was ordered by the federal government. And uh, they were, they were uh, 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 going, escorted us from, from Birmingham, Alabama to Montgomery. Now I wasn't with that group at that time. So th then when they got to Birmingham, the police, Escort and the National, they all left. And then this crowd beat up all the riders that were going from Birmingham to, to Montgomery. Then they sent in a, a National Guard and everything, broke that up. And uh, th that's when I, I ended the picture for the Freedom Rides. We rented a car and drove down to Montgomery. And we, we got there the day after the all the violence had broken around the Reverend Ralph Abernathy's church. The next day we drove, uh, we rode from uh, Montgomery to Jackson, Mississippi, but we had an escort all the way down. But d during the time when everybody had to take a rest stop, they, had, they would take you to a uh, African-American nightclub or something like a restaurant and you had to go to the restroom and the African American place because blacks and whites couldn't mix, although there were blacks and whites on the bus right. that were going to Mississippi. We got to Mississippi, uh, they signed, see, no, no color allowed, and all that. And we went inside, uh, it was pandemonium there in this Greyhound bus station. People were hanging on the balconies, taking pictures, and all this stuff. They arrested us for breach of peace, took us down to jail and uh, arraigned us and we had a trial and uh, we, we got four months, I think it was, and $200 fine or something for breach of peace. And they put us in jail and some folks uh, opted out to appeal. And, they, and so uh, uh, we, we, we were that there separated. I got put in solitary confinement because I protested the, the treatment that they were doing one of the fellow uh, inmates. Of, so I think his name Dave Dennis was who he was. And um, 
I got put in a solitary confinement, dark room with a little hole in the middle of the room and everything. And then the sheriff came up and said, nah, we, you, we want to tell you boys, we don't want no trouble, you know. Uh, you, you know, we, we, we get, we'll all get along. So then he took us back down to the main cell. This time we weren't in the jail. We were in the county, Hines County Jail. So I was there a few days. We had a hunger strike and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, uh, then I, I think I got out on bail. And when I got on bail, they transferred all, all the people who were there to uh, Raymond County. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm jumping the gun. I forgot. Before I got out on bail, they took us out to James uh, Raymond County Prison Farm. And um, they interrogated each one of them. So a couple of them, get, there were two young ladies with them. They, a couple of them got beaten up by these white deputies in, in, in uh, Raymond County Prison Farm. This is, it's, it's Raymond County, but it was a, that, that's, that's, that's the prison farm in Mississippi, which is right outside of Jackson. So one of my, my cellmate at, at Raymond County, he's John Moody. He said to me, he says, Leroy, he says, uh, don't, don't, uh, when you go down there, say yes, sir, and no, sir. Well, I, I was raised to so uh, yes, sir, and no, sir, too. <laughs> but they, they, they wanted, they wanted all black folks to, to say yes, sir, and no, sir. So I went out there and I said, put my head, my, 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 back against the wall. And John Moody had told me that they beat him up for not saying yes, sir. So I put my back to the wall. And so he's telling me, he said, I'm Warren Max and Sullivan. We, we, we have certain rules that be, you must say yes, sir, and no, sir, because our guards demand respect. So I, 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 I'm shaking my hand. I, I, I look at one, and one of them say, SOB. You know, so then he turned back to me. He said, now there would be no shaking of the head pounding on the desk. He said, now are you, are you, are you, are you uh, gonna say yes, sir? I, and I said to him, I'm a rebel, natural rebel. I said, no, you got your answer. I said, get up and, go, and don't walk too fast. So I, about this time, I'm looking at these three guards that were sitting there and the one that Call me the name. He gets up. He gets up out of his seat. About this time, he said, don't, "Don't walk too fast. I'm speeding." He pulls his gun out of his holster. Thank you, Lord, for being with me. You know, I got back to cell. Nobody put a hand on. Him. Then after that, one of the inmates who was with us got out on bail, and he called Robert Kennedy, Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy sent a group down there and they transferred transfer them back to the Hines County, uh, Hines County Jail. Mm. And then we, we went on a hunger strike and then, then one thing, then eventually I, I you know, I, I, I got bailed out. A little bit more for me about your journey, because as you tell the story about what's occurred for you, many times it looked as though that your life was definitely in jeopardy and you feared your life. Um, what was it that made you say, you know what, I'm willing to put my life on the line? I think that's, that's the thing that really gets me about a lot of the Freedom Riders and even those John Lewis and Dr. King, um, really just willing to put their life on the line. What was it for you that said, I'm willing to risk my life? Well, I don't think I gave it that deep of intellectual scrutiny. But I, well, I got caught up in the moment, you know. Every, everybody was involved, and I wanted to be a part of that involvement. But I, 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 I didn't even consider, you know, I might get killed or anything like that. I just, well, I guess I, the Lord was on my side. You know? No, I don't guess. I know the Lord was on my side. Yeah, yeah. 
And for many people, the civil rights movement, of course, the 60s was uh, tied to, you mentioned Ralph Abernathy. One person that we haven't talked about is Dr. King. Uh, what was your interaction, if any, with Dr. King during this whole period of time? Well, Dr. King came to Nashville several times and spoke and everything. But the one significant thing, when he gave I Have a, my, his I Have a Dream speech, mm -hmm. well, if you were to look to his left, on his the level that he was at the end of the steps, you would have seen me. I, that's where I was during the I Have a Dream speech. You know. John Lewis also gave a speech there, uh, very profound, and that was where people began to recognize who he was. Well, I remember because I had the opportunity of meeting, uh, you know, Congressman John Lewis, and uh, we had the opportunity to have lunch together. Uh, and that's my vivid memory of having a one-on-one -on -one lunch with him uh, in Washington, D.C. It was arranged by uh, then our Congressman, uh, John Katko, who wanted to talk to, we talked about social justice and we talked about being involved. Um, and then he proceeded to take me on this walking tour of all of the pictures in his office. And you talked about the, the March on Washington. And I remember because he took me to that picture and he showed me that picture. And this is what he said. He said, uh, this picture is a picture of when I spoke at the March on Washington. There were 10 speakers that day. I was number eight. Dr. King was number 10. And of all the speakers of the, at, the Mar at the March on Washington, I'm the only one that's still alive. And it was my thought that when he passed away, history actually passed away and history went on to be with history. And so of all the speakers that, that were there, all have since deceased, but you're still alive to tell the story. So what do you want people to know about yourself, people like John Lewis, people like Dr. King, people like Abernathy? What do you want people to know? Well, if you're persistent and you don't take no for an answer, uh, 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 then you will be successful. You have to be saying trust in God. If you trust in God, you will make it. Are you happy with what you're seeing today? I mean, obviously, uh, we're seeing a lot of protests and we're seeing some change in the criminal justice system, uh, particularly by way of police officers ad addressing police brutality. Are you happy with the activism that you're seeing today? Yes and no. Uh, it, 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 it's like it's a cyclical thing, up and down, up and down, and doesn't really not, it, to me, it's not, cons not consistent enough. They get diverted too easy about them. But one thing I, that I, 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 I'm proud to know is that here in Syracuse, they had that 40, 40 day march uh, uh, for Black Lives Matter. And, I thought, and the people stuck with it for 40 days. So I thought that was a, a wonderful. Just yeah, well, I think, but I think, Dr. Wright, uh, you know, Glenn Wright, that it's also about your just due. I think Americans don't know the sacrifice that you made as being a freedom rider. I think that when we talk about the freedom riders, the big names will always get the attention, of course, and, and rightfully so. You've got the John Lewis's, you've got the Dr. Martin Luther King's. Uh, I know also another, you know, another person, uh, the Reverend Emery Proctor, a uh, big name out of Syracuse, New York, pastor of the People's Church. Um, he was a freedom rider and yourself. And you guys actually um, literally put your lives on the line. And I think that if we look at activism today and we look at where we are today, we also have to look back from whence we came. And when we look back at whence we came, we wouldn't be where we are as far as voting rights, as far as civil rights, as far as many of the rights, if it wasn't for a person such as yourself. So you deserve it and, 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 you, and you definitely need that and then much, much more. Um, and so give me that thought about what it means to you today, looking back at the part that you played in history. Well, to me, it, uh, it, it seems that we still have a long way to go. You know, we still have police brutality, which is plaguing the, the, the black community uh, over and over and over again, and nothing being done. You got to look in Chicago, out in Seattle, all the, the uh, President Trump has sent in National Guard to beat down the people in both those cities. And, you know, we, we have a long way to go, you know, and, 
Yeah. Unfortunately, it, it, this far, like the 40 some years since the original free riding sit ins and stand in, we still fighting the battle. You mentioned the name Bull Connor earlier. Of course, I'm very familiar with Bull Connor. Also, President Lyndon Johnson. When you think about President Lyndon Johnson and you think about President Donald Trump, um, do you find similarities? Uh, I, I wouldn't put uh, 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 Donald Trump in, in the same uh, lane as Lyndon Johnson. I, I have a greater respect for Lyndon Johnson than I do with Donald Trump. Donald Trump is for Donald Trump and only for Donald Trump. But uh, he, he said, it looks like he's seeing the handwriting on the wall that the polls are saying that he, uh, uh, he he's he's not going to uh, not going to be reelected, and, and uh, uh, it, it's it's just it's a sin and shame. Now you mentioned Congressman Crackle; he's not one of my favorite either. You know, so uh, 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 Dana Balter, I think, should be uh, elected. Um, yeah. And for those who don't know, uh, up in the upstate New York area, there is a congressional seat that's up for grabs. Uh, Congressman John Cackle, the Republican incumbent, who's also uh, endorsed Donald Trump, is going up against the uh, Democrat, Dana Balter. And so when you hear uh, Reverend Glenn Wright say about uh, Dana Balter, uh, that's the Democrat that's running for the seat uh, compared to uh, the Congressman, the incumbent, uh, John Cackle. Are you hopeful? Uh, that this presidential election will bring about change um, in America. I hope so. I hope that uh, 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 Joe Joe Biden uh, uh, nominates Stacey Adams from Atlanta, Georgia. That's who I like to see as his running mate, and see the two of them get elected. Mm. And talk to me about what do you want to see by activism? Because there's a lot of activists out there, people with boots on the ground. What's the message you want to send to them as a freedom rider, as a civil rights uh, advocate, as one who fought for human rights and one who's been on the battlefield far longer than many people who are uh, presently alive today? Talk to us about what you want to see. Well, I want to see people get more involved. You want to see more people register and vote. A lot of people are registered and they're not voting. You know, they, they say, what's the answer? It's, nothing's changing, and so they won't exercise their constitutional right. But I think I would like to encourage more people to register to vote and then and, and, uh, encourage them to encourage other people to register and vote. Well, Reverend Leroy Glenwright, I just want to thank you because I think that you're a legend. Um, I think when we talk about the civil rights icons of John Lewis, C.T. Vivian, uh, Joseph Laurie, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Ralph Abernathy, and all of these other great names that we that we have that, that are worthy of accolades and worthy of honor, that your name ranks right up there with them. And so it's been a pleasure, a privilege, and an honor to actually have you sharing with us here on the Social Justice Forums. Thank you so much for, first of all, your sacrifice and your continued labor of love in the area of racial justice, equity, and also civil rights. The Reverend Leroy Glenwright.